All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. To Martha he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Before we open God's word together this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful that you have revealed to us in your word who you are, who we are, and the desperate nature of human sin. Because of sin, we are spiritually dead. We have no hope. We have no life. And we have no eternal life or relationship with you. There's no real joy. There's no real stability. There's no real, um, f- a real future for those without Christ. And Father, we're thankful that we have an understanding of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ because of your word that has revealed to us that he is the one who has come to uh, deliver us, to rescue us, to save us, and that this is ours by a free gift. All we must do is accept it by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Now, Father, as we study today, we're continually reminded that we live in light of your plan and in light of your future plan, in light of eternity, that Jesus Christ has come in the past where he where he suffered and died for us, where he experienced the cross, but he will come in the future when he will receive a crown and a kingdom. And as we study that today, may we recognize that though these principles focus on your plan for Israel, nevertheless there are implications for each of us as believers in terms of our own spiritual preparation for the future. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me this morning to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, and we're continuing our study in Matthew and our study in the Olivet Discourse, which covers Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter chapter 25. This morning, we'll look at a number of things, but primarily we're going to look at the distinction between the rapture of the church and the second coming. Now, this is not something that's new to many of you, but this is a problem for many people, and it's also part of some of the discussion related to the interpretation of the latter part of Matthew chapter uh, 24. So it's important for us to stop as we did in the previous lesson where we talked about what is revealed about the day of the Lord and to talk about the rapture and the distinction between the rapture and the second coming. So as we look at our passage this morning, I want to do three things. First of all, we're going to review, take a look at what we have learned so far in Matthew chapter 24. I keep doing this because this seems to me to be foundational to the un- truly understanding some of the, the, the debates, discussions, the differences of opinion, even among uh, dispensational futurists. And I remind you that a dis- dispensationalism is a theology that is based upon, number one, a consistent literal interpretation of Scripture. It's that word consistent that's so important because there are uh, many people who follow the dictates of Bertrand Russell who said consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. Consistency is important in Scripture. Literal interpretation doesn't mean what those who disagree with us claim, which is some sort of wooden uh, literalism. It is to use language in its plain normal sense, recognizing that, that language is composed of numerous idioms, language is composed of, of lots of figures of speech, and all of these, though, have set stable meanings. And so it's very important to interpret those uh, 
aspects of language, the way they were used at the time the Bible uh, the Bible was written. So we believe in a consistent literal interpretation. The second feature of dispensationalism is a that there is a distinction in God's plan for his plan for Israel and his plan for the church. That God made promises and covenants with Israel in the Old Testament and God plans to fulfill each of those literally to the letter. He has not replaced Israel with the church in the church age, but the church is a distinct, separate uh, body of saints, body of believers, who, who have a distinct future in God's plan and purpose. God's plan for Israel will be fulfilled. The nation will be redeemed as a nation. Individuals will be redeemed. They will be given the kingdom that was promised in the Old Testament, as we've seen over and again in our study of Matthew, that Matthew is all about the, the coming kingdom and a focus on Jesus as that promised and prophesied messianic king. And when we understand that, a lot of the problems in Matthew fade away if it's interpreted in light of what Matthew is emphasizing. And so this is very, very important in understanding some of the things, in, of course, in Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 24. The third aspect of dispensationalism is that dispensationalists believe that the organizing theme of Scripture and of God's plan in history is God's glory. Uh, many other systems, most other systems, think that the organizing principle is redemption. Problem with that is it's terribly limited. It doesn't include anything about the angels or God's plan and purposes for the angelic creation, and yet that's part of God's revelation. So we have to have a broad enough overall principle. We've studied that many times in our studies on God's plan for the ages. That's a dispensationalist. Dispensationalists, though, disagree in places over how they understand prophecy. We've seen that in the first in the first um, 13 verses especially that I identified six different views there and I explained the strengths and weaknesses of those and um, there are some other problems in um, in the second half as well and we'll be facing uh, facing those we believe in futurism that's very important because there are a lot of people who hold to uh, what is called preterism, which we'll not spend too much time talking about, and that is that everything in Matthew 24 was fulfilled in the past. It's all symbolic language used to talk about the coming judgment in A.D. 70. And so Jesus came, the second coming was fulfilled in A.D. 70 when Jesus came in the clouds in judgment. Y'all knew that, right? That we're really living in the millennium? That's what happened. That's their view. That's gained a resurgence in the last 30 or 40 years. There's the historicist view that somehow we're somewhere along this time scale and we can look at between Revelation 4 and Revelation 19 and somehow figure out where we are in there because it's all uh, translated in some sort of symbolic code. That is very popular and very common. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Uh, we believe that the Bible teaches that these things are all in the future, that Matthew 24 and 25 talk about future events that come not only after the present church age, but after those last seven years in God's plan for Israel known as the tribulation. So we are futurists. We believe everything in Revelation 4 through the end of the book focuses on that which is future, that which is subsequent to the present present church age. These things are important for understanding what Jesus is talking about here. We'll review this. We'll also look at the difference between the rapture and the second coming because as we can uh, conclude it in our study of verses 29 through 31, the coming of the Son of Man in glory, uh, there's a lot of confusion. Those who believe in a post-tribulation rapture uh, go there and identify that as the rapture as well, and we'll see why that is a fallacious interpretation. And then we will briefly introduce the next two verses which help to focus on the next section of Matthew 24, and that's the parable of the fig tree. So, let's review a little bit. What have we learned so far in Matthew chapter 24? Matthew chapter 24 is 
Jewish in context. It's not talking about the church age. I'll say a little bit about, about, more about that in a second. It is focusing on the end times of Israel. It is Jewish in context. He's talking to the disciples as Jewish believers answering a specific question that is Jewish in nature. He has just announced judgment on the religious leaders of Israel and the nation of Israel in Matthew chapter 23 that will culminate in the destruction of the temple. And so the disciples ask a very important question, and that is, well, uh, when will this take place? What are the signs of your coming in the end of the age? These are very Jewish terms. And so we must interpret this within that framework. It's not talking about the church. In the Jewish fr framework, in Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27, Daniel predicted there would be a period of 490 years uh, decreed by God for the Jewish people. What would begin that 490 year period was a decree for the people to rebuild and refortify the city of Jerusalem. That occurred in 444 B.C. when Artaxerxes gave a commission to Nehemiah to go back to Jerusalem and complete the building of the walls and the fortifications. You can track this by days and 173,880, excuse me, 880 days later, you can track this chronologically and that was completed, that time frame of the first 69 weeks ended with what we call Palm Sunday, the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And then there's a pause because Daniel is told that after that 69th period, then the Messiah is cut off, and then the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. So there's clearly a pause between the 69th week and the 70th week. And the 70th week hasn't occurred yet. It will occur in the future. It begins when the prince who is to come signs a peace treaty with Israel, a covenant with Israel. And this, uh, this first period of this last 70th week, or seven-year period, is called the time of Jacob's trouble in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. In Matthew 24, 8, we saw that Jesus said this would be the beginning of the labor pains, but the end is not yet. And then there will be the midpoint of the tribulation period when the Antichrist will desecrate the temple and set up his idol in the temple, and this is called the abomination of desolation. And then the second half, and that is before the, that's when the end will then come, Matthew 24, 14. So these two questions the disciples ask are, when will these things be? And that really isn't addressed in Matthew's uh, rendition of the Olivet Discourse. He doesn't focus on that. Luke does in Luke 21, 20 to 24. And Luke 21, 20 to 24 was fulfilled in AD 70. When will these things be? When will the temple be destroyed, in other words? And that's uh, part of Luke's focus. Jerusalem, he says, will be captured. The Jews will be led away captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will begin to be trampled by the Gentiles until the end of the time of the Gentiles. So those uh, five verses focus on the beginning of the times of the Gentiles, which is now. Okay, we're in the church age. And then the second part of this question is really a two-part question. Uh, when will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Because in Jewish rabbinical thought, these were connected together, that they, there was the, they were in the present age, and then there was the age to come. The present age in their thinking was would end when the Messiah came and he established his kingdom. So the present age was now, and then the kingdom would come. Remember, this is the main theme in Matthew, focusing on the coming of the kingdom. So their question is a kingdom-related question. It has nothing at all to do with the church or the church age. Their questions are related to God's plan for the future of Israel and the temple and that excludes a church age focus anywhere in Matthew 24 and 25. We must remember 
as they ask this question, what will be the sign of your coming? That sign is first mentioned. There are many things mentioned that are precursors, but the sign is specific. We all, as I pointed out, we often hear people say, what are the signs? It's a singular word, and the sign is specific according to Jesus. The Son of Man will appear, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. I think that is not a cross. That is the brilliant, we studied this in the past couple of lessons, a brilliant flash of light piercing this incredible darkness that comes at the end of the day of the Lord when the sun is darkened and the moon won't give its light. Of course, if the sun's dark, the moon won't give its light because it reflects the sun. Into that darkness will pierce the Shekinah glory of the second person of the Trinity, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will then descend uh, to the earth. They will then see, they have the sign, they'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. Now, as I pointed out, this isn't talking about the church. Let's talk about that for just a minute. I've alluded to this in the past. I want to put these verses up. The word church is the Greek word ekklesia. It's only used two times in Matthew, and it's not used at all in Mark, Luke, or John. The focus of the Gospels is not on the church. The focus of the Gospels is mostly on Israel and God's plan for Israel. The two uses of ecclesia in Matthew are instructive. Only Matthew 16, 18 uses it in the sense of church. The basic meaning of the word ecclesia is an assembly or a gathering, and it becomes a technical use after its use in Acts 5, 11 for the church as we know it today. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus, after uh, asking Peter, what do men, who do men say that I am, says, uh, I will, uh, he praises uh, Peter for what he has said, and he says, on this rock I will build my church. Two things, it's future. It wasn't, there wasn't a church then. He, what, he doesn't say, I'm building my church. He said, I will build my church, it's future. That's the only time he uses it in the technical sense that we think of it. Do they have any content to that word church at this point? Absolutely not. They, don't, they probably heard that and they're thinking in their frame of reference, he's gonna build a, a new kind of assembly because that, they haven't been given any content to this new church. The mystery doctrine of the church, the unrevealed doctrine of the church has not been revealed through Paul yet or any of the other uh, apostles. So he, that's technical. Matthew 18, 17, talking about if a believer, another, or if another person offends you, go to them personally, and then if you don't have resolution, then take somebody else, and then eventually if there's no resolution, take, tell it to the assembly. This isn't talking about the church. It's not prophetic. It's not future. It would have just been used in its generic sense. So really, before Matthew 24, we only have one technical use of the word church, but it really doesn't involve any teaching whatsoever about that. what that is. So to introduce the concept of the church, church suddenly into Matthew 24 doesn't make sense as a lawyer in a courtroom would say there's no foundation there's nothing given that would indicate that what we do have throughout Matthew is this emphasis on the kingdom a third thing we should note is that Matthew 24 it by its context is not talking about anything related to the church, the church age, or the rapture of the church. It is talking about this period of, 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 that will precede the coming. That's what the question is. Jesus isn't answering another question. He's answering the question they ask. What we've seen is that in Matthew 24, 4 through 8, he talks about the first half of Daniel's 70th week called the beginning of labor pains. In Matthew 24, 9 through 14, we've seen that he's talking about the second half of the tribulation where there's an increased persecution of Israel and Jewish believers. In the first half, there's no persecution towards Jewish believers, towards Jews, because they're under the peace treaty of the Antichrist. But he violates that, stops this morning and evening sacrifices uh, when he commits the abomination of desolation. And from the midpoint on, all hell will literally break loose towards Israel. 
Israel. And that's why starting in Matthew 24, 15 to 24, Jesus begins to tell, address Jewish believers that when you see the abomination of desolation, flee you who are in Judea and Jerusalem, not Houston, not Los Angeles, not New York, London, Moscow, anywhere else. Those of you who are in Judea and Jerusalem flee to the mountains. Okay, we believe in literal interpretation. Jerusalem means Jerusalem. Judea means Judea. Rome means Rome. They're not secret code words for something else. So, and then when they flee, they're not to be deceived by false reports, fake news, about Jesus coming. That, oh, he's over here, or he's hiding over here. Y'all come out of hiding, come out of the wilderness. That's what the Antichrist is going to do to try to trap him so that he can slaughter them. And then in Matthew 24, 25 to 29, we see um, the specific statement that, that after the, the tribulation of those days, the sign of the Son of Man will come. This is in verse 29. Uh, after, the sun, after the tribulation of those days, the sign of the Son of Man uh, will, will come and appear in, in heaven. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. I looked at this last time in the previous lesson. A parallel in Mark 13, 24 states the same thing. It's after that tribulation. So this is talking about something that occurs at the end of the tribulation period, not at the beginning. And that it is accompanied by certain uh, signs in the heavens. The sun darkened, the, uh, the sun darkened, the moon won't give its light. Other passages talk about it looks like the moon is turned to blood. That's not John Hagee's blood moons. He was completely uh, off on that whole thing. Didn't read the context of any of the passages he was talking about. This occurs at the end of the tribulation and it's all happens at the same time. The sun's dark and the moon doesn't give its light all at the same time. And this, it creates this hyper darkness on the planet that the return of Christ will, will penetrate. So this is all preceded as we've studied in Revelation and in the previous weeks that the, the, this is preceded by the seal judgments. That's covered in Revelation chapter 6 but that's outlined in Matthew 24, 4 through 7. It's also preceded by the abomination of desolation, described in Matthew 24, 15. It's preceded by the most intense period of the tribulation, Matthew 24, 51, or Matthew uh, 24, 20, uh, 21, talks about the fact that this is going to be the, the uh, uh, a unique uh, time period. There will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world uh, until this time, no, nor ever shall be again. And this is then after, immediately after that period when this occurs. This is related, as we studied the last time, to what is described as the great and awesome day of the Lord in Joel 2, uh, 31. Two observations. Though some uses of the term day of the Lord refer to God's judgments in history, either against Israel or against some other nations, th those are just two or three of the uses. It generally refers to a time of divine judgment. But... And in the, although some future uses may include the entire seven-year period of the tribulation, from the numerous verses we looked at the last time, we saw that the term day of the Lord refers to this period immediately preceding the second coming of Christ, this event where you have these cosmological uh, events that take place and the sun being darkened and the, uh, the, and the moon not giving its light, that kind of a thing. And then, but it's not to be confused with other similar events that we see in Revela like in Revelation 6.14, which is at the end of the seal judgments. There's a series of judgments described in Revelation. First the seal judgments, then the trumpet judgments, then the bowl judgments. There are seven seal judgments. When the seventh seal is opened, it reveals seven trumpet judgments. 
These are consecutive. When the seventh trumpet judgment blows, it reveals seven bowl judgments. It's after the last bowl judgment that we have the day of the Lord, the campaign of Armageddon, and Jesus returning to the earth. So there are similar things, but as we will see in, in our study in just a minute, a key principle in interpretation of hermeneutics, which is constantly violated by many, many scholars and preachers, is that similarities don't equal sameness. Just because something is described in generally similar terms doesn't mean they're the same thing. Therefore, we go to the second question is what are the differences between the rapture and the second coming? There are too many scholars that come along and talk about the various passages and they say, well, because they include these cosmological disturbances, because they talk about Jesus coming, they talk about clouds, they talk about angels, that they're talking about the same thing, but they're not. Similarities do not mean, sorry about the typo there, similarities do not mean that things are the same. We all know that there's a difference between cars and trucks, but there are a lot of similarities. They have two axles, they have four tires, they have an engine in the front, uh, they have some carrying capacity, some can carry only two passengers, some can carry four passengers, uh, but the difference between a car and a truck is that a truck has uh, carrying capacity in the back for a lot of different things that you can you can put back there. We are ha going to have a picnic next Saturday. We need folks who have trucks who can help. We always have three or four or five trucks who carry tables and different things out there. If everybody showed up with a car, we wouldn't be able to accomplish the mission but we all automatically understand that they have a lot of similarities, but that's not the point. The point is the differences. And that's the same thing with these various passages in Scripture. When Wayne House was here for the pastor's conference and taught on interpretation, he used the illustration of the difference between a bush and a tree. Uh, there are many similarities between bushes and trees, but bushes are not trees and trees are not bushes. We could also use an illustration the difference between an F-35 jet fighter and a C-130 uh, transport. They both have uh, powerful engines. They are both airplanes. They both fly, but they're, they both have instrumentation. They both have uh, cockpits. They're both flown by a You can go on with all the similarities, but, but they are very, very different in what they can do and what they can accomplish, and you would never uh, confuse the two. And there's a lot of similarities between a daffodil and a daisy, but daffodils are not daisies. There are differences. It's the differences that are important. That reminds me of a line from uh, the musical Gigi from Maurice Chevalier talking about the difference between men and women. There are a lot of similarities between men and women. But as he said, vive les différences. It's the difference that's important. So we need to talk a little bit about the rapture. What exactly is the rapture? You will hear from a lot of people, scholars at times say, well, the Bible doesn't talk about the rapture. I don't see that word anywhere in my Bible. Well. You don't see the word Trinity anywhere in your Bible either. Trinity was a word coined by Tertullian in the uh, late second century to describe accurately what the Bible teaches. So there are a lot of words that we use to describe biblical doctrines that those words aren't actually found in the English. They may not be found in the Greek or the Hebrew, but in this case, the root word for rapture is found in the Latin translation. The, first of all, the definition, the rapture, is the translation of all living believers from the earth at the end of the church age, immediately following the resurrection of all dead church age believers. The rapture occurs before the tribulation begins. The 
verse, the indisputable verse for the rapture, because even though some people may not believe in a pre-trib rapture, they believe in some sense that there is a rapture, is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the broad context is 13 through 18, which I had John read this morning. But the central passage is in verses 15 through 18. There Paul says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. Now what he's addressing is the fact that the Thessalonian believers had become somewhat confused about what happens when a believer dies because Paul had taught them about this, as we see in this passage. He taught them about prophecy. Some people say, well, we don't need to study prophecy. That's going to happen hundreds of years from now. We need practical things on how to live today. Well, the Bible teaches us about everything and we're to learn about everything that God has revealed to us, not just what we in our limited finite knowledge think might be uh, applicable to our lives. And when somebody dies, we immediately want to know well, what happened to them. And that's what happened after Paul had spent maybe two, possibly three months with the Thessal Thessalonian believers. Uh, they asked him questions. They thought Jesus would come back at any moment because Paul believed in the imminent or at any moment return of Jesus. And then when the first believer died, they, they were, what happens? What do we do? And that's when Paul says that we grieve, but not like those who have no hope. And he goes on to say, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, this is what Jesus taught. I wonder how many here can tell me where Jesus taught about the rapture. John 14, 1 through 3. John 14, 1 through 3. In fact, there are a number of different words but that are seen in both passages, but that's another topic, another message, another lesson. Uh, that's where Jesus taught about it. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am you may be also. Okay, that's going to indicate that, that Jesus is in some uh, heavenly area, not on the earth. So the rapture doesn't occur at the end of the tribulation where Jesus is coming down and there'd be this really whoop down where uh, Christians would be raptured and keep coming down with him. John 14, 1 through 3, he's going somewhere where he's uh, creating living spaces for us that we can be with him in heaven not on the earth. If the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation, we're going to end up on the earth, not in heaven. So Jesus says, I mean, Paul says, he say this by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those of us who are still alive, Something will happen to us, but it won't happen before something happens to those who have already died. The word asleep is just a euphemism. It doesn't mean soul sleep. It just is a euphemism for those, and it's only applied in the New Testament to those who are Christians, to believers who have died, and, uh, and it just refers to the fact, and it emphasizes that they will be waking up, that is, the resurrection. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Three things happen. There's going to be a shout. Uh, there's going to be the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. So what we see here is phrases like coming of the Lord, angel. There's an angel accompanying this. There's the trumpet of God. And then there's resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. So there are those who come along and say, see, that's similar to the passages over here, so they must be talking about the same thing. This is just at the end of the tribulation. Now, similarity doesn't mean they're identical. First Thess 4.17 then tells us what happens after, immediately after, the dead in Christ rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, some people stop there. But you see, Paul is very practical. After he's talked about what some people think is an esoteric doctrine about prophecy and why do we need to know about end times and all that stuff anyway, I need to solve problems with the way I spend money and with my personal problems with sin, etc., etc., Paul shows us how practical it is. The last verse. 
Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, I would suggest that many of us have been in circumstances and situations where we have uh, been with people who have had a close friend or spouse or family member die. How many times does the Bible talk about comforting people at the time of death? Maybe one or two other times generally, but this is the specific passage. And what does God say you're weird to do? How are we to comfort people? Give them a hug? Well, that's nice. Send them a card? That's nice. I'm not saying we shouldn't do any of those things. But what Paul says is to comfort them with the doctrine of the rapture. We're to teach them about what is going to happen to believers who have died that Jesus will return and there will be a physically, physical bodily resurrection in the air and then if we're still alive, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds and will be reunited and we will all be spending eternity in heaven and we will, this will just be a vague, foggy memory. The word caught up together was translated into the Latin Vulgate with the Latin word rapio, which is where we get our word, our English word rapture. So when people say, well, you can't find the rapture anywhere in the Bible, they're just not looking in the right language. And most of them probably aren't even looking in Greek either. The word that is used here is harpazo in the Greek, which means to be caught up or to seize something. Sometimes it was used to describe a thief coming in and seizing or stealing something. It's used here uh, as a term for our rapture. So what we see between the Matthew 24 passage and 1 Thessalonians 4 is the similarities. Clouds, air, the Lord, the word coming, and also a resurrection. But it's not the similarities, it's the differences that matter. So let's review some of the distinctions between the rapture and the second coming. At the rapture, there will be a translation of all believers. We are instantly, all believers are translated. We receive our resurrection body. But that's not what happens at the second coming at all. When you read Revelation 19, Jesus is coming with the angels and with the saints to the earth. And there's no resurrection or, or, or rapture uh, associated with translation associated with that at all. At the rapture, the translated saints go to heaven. John 14, that where I am, you may be also. But at the second coming, you have translated saints that are coming with the Lord to the earth. He is, where is he coming from? He's coming from heaven. At the rapture, when you look at rapture passages, the earth is not judged, but what happens subsequent to Jesus' return to the earth is the earth is judged. There are various judgments that take place immediately following his return. There's a judgment, as we'll see in Matthew 25, uh, a judgment on the Gentiles, how they treated Jews during, and it's called the sheep and the goat judgment. There's a judgment of surviving Jewish believers. That's at the first part of Matthew 25. There's a judgment of, of, um, uh, of the nations. All of this takes place uh, when Jesus returns at the second coming. The rapture is an imminent event. It can happen at any moment. There's nothing that must take place before the rapture occurs. It can be at any moment. It's a doctrine of imminency. Uh, and imminency means it's unexpected. We're not looking for anything to precede the rapture. Now, that doesn't mean that some things that are going to happen after the rapture can't have some uh, preparation taking place before the rapture, but that's not a fulfillment that's necessary for the rapture to occur. It doesn't tell us it's any sooner. doesn't mean it's any quicker. Uh, it could happen at any moment. It could happen now, tomorrow. It could happen 100 years from now. Uh, stage setting doesn't mean it's, it's closer. Progression of time means it's closer. It's 
closer for us than it was for the Apostle Paul. That's just basic logic. But it doesn't mean that just because we see things that seem to be setting up the tribulation period more and more, that it's going to happen very soon. You have a lot of wonderful uh, Bible scholars and prophecy teachers who were convinced that the rapture would occur in their life, especially after the um, uh, resurrection of the Jewish state, but didn't happen. The rapture is not predicted at all in the Old Testament. Why not? Well, there's no mention of the church in the Old Testament. If God had told Israel in the Old Testament that there's going to be a, a future, uh, future body, a future spiritual organism called the church, that would raise the question of why. And the answer to that is because you're going to fail. That, well, that sort of predetermines your outcome. So the church was never mentioned in the Old Testament. Why Paul calls it a mystery doctrine. Mystery in the New Testament means something that has never before been revealed. So it's not predicted at all in the Old Testament. Um, but the second coming, the coming of the Messiah to establish his kingdom, is mentioned again and again throughout all of the prophets in the Old Testament. Six, the rapture is for believers only, those who are dead in Christ and those who are living believers. Now, some people think that there's a lot of people in Christian churches who are dead in Christ. Some of them are asleep in Jesus also. They come to church on Sunday morning or during the week, and they're asleep in Jesus after five minutes of the message. But... Uh, this is talking about those who are phys have physically died and they are in Christ. So the rapture is for believers only, but the second coming affects everyone because Jesus is going to come back. He's going to rescue Israel, destroy the armies of the Antichrist and the false prophet. He judges uh, the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, the Antichrist is killed. According to Isaiah chapter 14, he'll be resurrected, probably the false prophet also, although he's not mentioned. And they're sent to the lake of fire. So there are these various judgments affects the whole world, and Jesus establishes his kingdom. The curse is rolled back, and it is a very different environment than what we have today. Uh, the rapture occurs before the day of wrath. Paul talks in, in um, 1 Thessalonians about the fact that we are not destined for the wrath to come. Wrath to come, wrath is not used of an eschatological uh, pro uh, punishment. It's not used of the lake of fire. It's used of the wrath of God that's revealed and poured out on man during history. Wrath of God always refers to God's judgment on man during history. So when you have the day of wrath mentioned, uh, the rapture occurs before that. We are not destined for that. But the second coming of Christ ends the day of wrath. The day of wrath is another term for the tribulation. At the rapture, rapture passages, there's no reference to Satan, but at the second coming, we're told that Satan is bound for a thousand years. He is removed from the earth, so people can no longer say, the devil made me do it. We don't have that scapegoat anymore. We can only say, it's me. It's my own sin nature. And that's what a lesson that will be taught in the millennial kingdom. It's perfect environment, no Satan, no fallen angels, none of that to influence man, but people with sin natures will grow and mature and reject Jesus, reject God, so that when Satan is released at the end of the th thousand years, he will lead a multitude in rebellion against Christ and his kingdom and God, and God will destroy them with fire and brimstone. At the rapture, Jesus Christ comes for his own, but at the second coming, Christ comes with his own. Clouds are mentioned both times. In the rapture, the clouds are in the air. Christ comes in the clouds, and we meet him in the clouds. But at the second coming, Christ comes from the clouds to the earth. And at that time, he will establish his kingdom. At the rapture, Christ will claim his bride, the church, and there will be a wedding feast that occurs after that. The wedding feast is analogous, the banquet is analogous to the whole millennial kingdom, that thousand-year period. At the second coming, 
the wedding has taken place, Christ comes with his bride, the church, to establish the kingdom. At the rapture, 12th point, only his own see him. The only ones who see him are those who are called to him and those who are dead in Christ and alive and remain shall be caught up with him uh, in the clouds. Uh, 12th uh, point on the second coming, every eye will see him and they will mourn him. This occurs at the second coming. After the rapture, point number 13, after the rapture, the tribulation begins. Not immediately. You'll hear some people say the tribulation, the rapture begins the tribulation. But according to Daniel chapter 9, the 70th week begins when the Antichrist, the prince who is to come, signs this contract or covenant peace treaty with Israel. That kicks off the, uh, that period. So the rapture occurs, and after that the tribulation begins. After the second coming, then the messianic kingdom begins. And it doesn't begin immediately. There is a transition period of time of judgments that take place between the second coming and the actual inauguration of the kingdom. So, so far we've reviewed. We've looked at the difference between the rapture and the second coming. And third is what's the meaning and significance of the parable of the fig tree? This is given in Matthew 24, 32, and 33. Jesus says now, and what he's doing is he's taking a step back and he's doing sort of what I've done today. We've gone verse by verse through Matthew 24. I did an excursus on the um, day of the Lord in the last lesson. Today it's, there's been an excursus or a side trip to uh, the contrast between the second coming and the rapture. And that's what Jesus does. He steps back from the chronological flow of events, and now he's going to give a parable to make a point. This is crucial for what's coming. He says, learn this parable from the fig tree. Now, a parable is a story of focusing on a real-life situation that is used to illustrate a, an abstract or a spiritual principle. He says, learn this par parable from the fig tree. When its branch has, has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that this summer is near. That particular fig tree there, you can't tell from the background, but I saw that the first year I went to Israel, and that's in, on the southern steps of the Temple Mount. And it was a huge, beautiful, luxuriant fig tree. It's not there anymore. The word parable comes from the Greek word parabole, which has a broad meaning. It can be anything from an allegory uh, to a poem or a proverb. But the way Jesus uses it is more technical. I believe all the parables relate to the kingdom and relate to Israel's Israel in the kingdom. Uh, but a parable is used to illustrate is a real life illustration used to instruct about some abstract or spiritual principle or truth. People do one of two commit one of two errors with parables. One is they read too little into it. One is they read too much into it. We don't listen to Jesus tell us what it means, and we have to. And He always tells us what it means in the context. And sometimes people want to make every detail in the parable walk on all fours. And that's not the point of a parable. And sometimes they, uh, they don't want to stick with what Jesus says he's talking about, and they reduce it and make hardly any significance out of it at all. So he's, he uses this real-life illustration that when the branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. And that happens year after year, like clockwork every spring. The, the uh, fig tree sprouts. When I was a little kid, my parents put a fig tree in the backyard, and, and it, it was still there up until the time I sold the house about four years ago and still produced an abundance of figs. And every year, once you saw those leaves coming out um, and, the, and the blooms and everything, you would know that summer was near and that uh, it wasn't long before there'd be fruit on the tree, and so it worked like clock clockwork. That's the analogy Jesus is saying, that when you see these things take place, what are the, these, these things? What he's just talked about. When you see uh, those events in the first half of the tribulation, when you see the abomination of desolation, when you see the events in the second half of the tribulation, when you see the the uh, 
uh, sun darkened and the moon not giving its light, you're going to know as a result of that that something's coming. Jesus is coming. That's what's near. You will know when you watch those events in the 70th week, not in the church age, but within the 70th week, you will know, you'll be able to tell that the end is near. And then he says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. Now, there have been a lot of uh, misrepresentations of this verse. First time I read anything about this was in a little book some of you have read called Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. Now, in almost, in almost every congregation, including this one, I've had people who got saved by reading Hal Lindsey's book, Late Great Planet Earth. There are some things in there I disagree with. Broadly, I agree with most of it. I remember some years ago, Pastor Theme was having lunch with um, Earl Rodmacher and asked Earl what he thought of Hal Lindsey's book. And Rodmacher said, well, I really didn't think much about it, but apparently God does. Because there are truly tens of thousands of people who have come to understand the gospel through reading that book. Prophecy is a great study to, uh, as a uh, prelude to people being saved. But Hal was a bit historicist instead of a futurist at this point. He said the most important sign in Matthew has to be the restoration of the Jews to the land in the rebirth of Israel. He saw that, that he was interpreting the fig tree to be the nation Israel. The fig tree often stands for the nation Israel in Scripture, and I think that even though that's not the point of this parable, it's not talking about Israel per se, there's an implication there by using the fig tree as the illustration. Jesus is making it clear that what he's talking about is related to Israel. It's not related to the church. I think that's important. Um, but Lindsay says what this means is the rebirth of Israel. Even the figure of speech fig tree has been a historic symbol of national Israel. When the Jewish people, after nearly 2,000 years of exile, under relentless persecution, became a nation again on the 14th of May, 1948, the fig tree put forth its first leaves. See how he's saying this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Well, that violates the principle of imminency. It violates futurism. He's violated his own hermeneutic at this point. He goes on to say, Jesus said that this would indicate that he was at the door ready to return. Then he said, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And what he did with that, he said, what generation? Obviously in context, the generation that would see the signs. But he puts the signs in the church age. And he said, chief among them is the rebirth of Israel, a generation in the Bible is something like 40 years. If this is a correct deduction, and it's not, uh, then with four, within 40 years or so of 1948, all these things could take place. Many scholars who've studied Bible prophecy all their lives believe that this is so. Well, that's not exactly true. But if you took 40 and added it to 48, you'd come out to 88 and subtract seven years for the tribulation, you end up with 1981. I mean, when I first read that, I said, God, the rapture's going to occur before 1981. See, he's date setting. He's not any different from the person who wrote the little book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 88. And when he didn't, he wrote another book called 89 Reasons Why Jesus Will Return in 89. You know, you can't date set. That's what we're going to get to next time when Jesus talks about no one knows the day or the hour. We'll come back and talk about that next time. But this sets the stage for tribulation believers. When you see these signs, you know that his coming is near, so you need to be ready. That's going to be the thrust of all the parables that follow this. They're not talking about the church age. They're talking about the failure of some to be ready, That's the, and they're unbelievers, the failure of some to be ready for the second coming. But there's application for the church age believer because Jesus can come in the rapture for us at any moment, and we need to be ready. We need to be living our lives today in light of eternity. Because what immediately follows the rapture of the church is the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, where we will be evaluated. Some will receive rewards, some will not. 
all will be saved, otherwise they wouldn't be there. All will spend eternity in the kingdom and then heaven, but some will be rewarded and have positions of, of responsibility and ruling in the kingdom, and others will not. What makes the difference is how we use our time. As Paul said, we are to redeem the time. We're to grow and mature spiritually because that prepares us, builds the capacity for us to be able to serve and reign in the coming kingdom with the Lord Jesus Christ. With our heads bowed, and our eyes closed. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study these things and to be reminded of, of your future plan. And that just as tribulation believers will need to be ready for your coming, so too church age believers need to be ready for the rapture. And we need to be living today in light of eternity, in light of your plan for us in the kingdom, that we will come with the Lord to the earth. We will be his cadre. Those who are rewarded will rule and reign with him as a kingdom of priests in the kingdom. Father, we pray that we might be motivated to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve him, to grow and mature through the study and application of your word in this church age. But above all, if anyone's here, or anyone is listening that has never trusted in Jesus as Savior, that is the key, the starting point. We're born spiritually dead. The only way to become spiritually alive, to have eternal life, is to believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and that nothing else contributes to that salvation. When the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do to be saved? The answer was to the point. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. He didn't say believe and repent. He didn't say believe and join a church. He didn't say believe and be baptized. He said uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, because it is the work of Christ at the cross that is determinative, and believing on him identifies us with his death, burial, and resurrection. Father, we pray that you would drive these truths home to each one of us through God the Holy Spirit and that we might respond to the challenge to live today in light of eternity. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.